Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, Charlie, thank Hello, you. Hello, Kevin. Yes, yes, it's like we actually have some members here on time. That's great. Madam Chairman, can I eat while you oh, talk? Please, Is that allowed? please, that's I'm allowed. Will anybody yeah, be for all? No, we're good. Sorry, I'm we're just good. arriving in town here. It's good. Thank Glad you. you're Sorry. here. A special welcome to our guests today. We want to have, we just not want to have a discussion focused on the issue that it's at hand as far as our economy and our desire to make sure that America remains the leader in the world, a competitor, uh, and someone where companies come, people who have ideas to improve our ways of life and make our, our lives better want to do it here in America. And so I appreciate everyone being here, taking time from your businesses to make the trip to Washington, D.C., and to talk about our status specifically as it relates to the medical innovation and, and on our desire to keep America as the global leader when it comes to medical innovation. I think we all agree that this nation is at a crossroads. Our unemployment has been stuck at 9.1% for a record length of time. Zero job creation last month, all but a stagnant economy. And we need to identify policies that will stimulate growth and I have every confidence that this Congress can do so. I believe that it's important that Americans and members of Congress hear directly from businesses about their experiences and what's happening on the ground, in the world, in the real world. And there's no better example than the medical technology industry. For decades, America's been the leader, employing over 400,000 Americans paying employees more than $24 billion, transporting more than $135 billion in products, both here and around the world, and yet all of this is threatened. It's threatened directly by the Food and Drug Administration, their bureaucracy. It's threatened by higher taxes. It's, it's threatened directly by cumbersome, costly regulations. And what this means for Americans is that businesses will move their operations overseas. Jobs will be lost. And America's access to everyday products like contact lenses and eyeglasses and thermometers to save to life-saving devices like stents and pacemakers and respirators will become more expensive and harder to come by. So I look forward to hearing from your examples, your experiences, and, and most of all, your recommendations as we move forward. And uh, so what we're going to do is uh, just hear from our, our guest and then the members that are here. Uh, we have a good number of members, actually. We'll, we'll uh, take your questions. And you can introduce yourselves at that time. So first up, let's see here. Get my piece of paper. Is uh, Alex... Um, Loki Nov Novi, <laughs> Nuvasive? That's <laughs> close. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> not that close. Oh. <laughs> I heard words, Alex. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, Luke please. Dianov. Luki. Okay, very yeah. good, very good. Glad you're here. <laughs> please uh, just tell us a little bit about your company uh, um, and, and then some of the challenges that you face and recommendations you have for the Congress. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The most interesting uh, pronunciation of my name today is still <laughs> Lex Lebensky. Oh. <laughs> and uh, yes. please turn on the mic. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, Alex Lukianoff, I'm chairman and CEO of Nuvasiv. Nuvasiv is a minimally invasive spine surgery company based in San Diego. Uh, we started as a startup um, by Kleiner Perkins, a very well-known VC firm some 12 years ago, so we've built the, uh, the entire company from the ground, and uh, we're now about 1,100 employees in total. What we've done in terms of our overall contribution to, to the space is that we have simplified uh, major spine surgery into an outpatient procedure, and it's kind of hard to comprehend um, being able to do that, but we came up with technology that is incredibly innovative, proprietary, that allows us to access the spine through the patient's side. So instead of doing surgery as you normally would through the back, cutting ligaments, muscles, bone, or through the belly, um, we come straight through the side. And it's very quick, and it's facilitated by, by our very unique technology that finds nerves, allows us to navigate the nerves, and get to the pathology point. What this has done, though, is it's made spine surgery better, faster, and cheaper. So a procedure that would typically take four hours to do can now be done in one hour or less. 
the patient can go home the same day or the next day versus four or five days later. They can return to work in six weeks versus three to six months. Uh, there are some particularly famous people that have had the, the procedure, uh, such as Bill Walton of NBA basketball fame, who um, was an absolute wreck with his back and now has his life back. He had to stop uh, being a broadcaster for ESPN years ago because his back was so bad. There was also a UFC fighter that had our technology and went back and fought another five times in the UFC in the octagon, which is, you know, can't say what his face looks like, but I know that his back, I know that his back is in very good shape, so it's the ultimate biomechanical test, I suppose. Um, but it's also cheaper for, for the hospital. It's a 10% savings to the overall hospital as far as costs are concerned. So, you know, hugely innovative technology. Um, it's the number two reason why people go to the doctor. It's because of back pain. So this is a large market. It's a $7 billion global market. And so we've, we've grown very well over the last few years because of innovation, but we've also been stymied by a regulatory process that really hasn't served us. And, and I think if you look at the, the last several years, the company has been founded on speed of innovation, on bringing products to market quickly, and we were launching about 10 new products per year. Our portfolio is about 75 products. That's been halved. Last year it was five products versus 10. And it's because of the delays that we've experienced with FDA. And this is now really correlated with a loss of jobs. And so as we put together our plans for this year, we estimated that all of the delays, without going through the specific details of these various submissions, but 510Ks and PMAs and so forth, have accumulated in about a $70 million loss, which is for a 500, in revenue, uh, for a $500 million company is very significant. We had to, to put off the hiring of about 150 people this year because these products did not make it to market. And this is not about an issue of safety or even efficacy. These are safe and efficacious products that are being really caught up in the quagmire of the regulatory process with constant requests for more information, additional tests that really don't have a clinical bearing. And so these things have had a very big impact on, on our company. Um, we're faced with a number of different challenges as we move forward. We're very concerned about the device tax, the medical device tax, because we believe that that, that would hamper us again on the R&D front. So we now have an FDA that is really not allowing us to get our products out quickly any longer. Uh, we've had to cut back on our workforce. And if the device tax goes through as planned, you know, that's probably a $15 million hit to us. And $15 million is a lot of people for a, for a company our size, in particular, as well as less innovation. So, um, and the things that, that you spoke of, uh, Congresswoman, the things that, that, um, that you hear about are absolutely true. We're looking at options now in Europe. Uh, the devices, for example, we have a device that we're trying to get approved through FDA, which has been on the market in Europe now for several years. And it's been used in thousands of patients. It's still not in the U.S., and we're battling to get that through, and it's a motion preservation device for the neck so that you can maintain mobility in your neck and get rid of the symptoms of pain in your arms. Um, and so now we're forced to look at a number of different options, including manufacturing outside the United States, um, for tax relief and for, for ways to be able to, to put our products forward in a very difficult environment. And it's the last thing we want to do. For me as CEO, I don't want to take jobs outside the United States. We've already been hit hard this year and expect the same to happen again next year. So those are some of the things that uh, we've been hit by. And, and I think that, you know, can certainly address them from a positive standpoint, too, in terms of uh, things that we believe could be done to change the way that FDA is going about things and perhaps save that for a subsequent question. That was good. An easier name. Uh, Steve Ferguson, chairman of the Cook Group. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and the opportunity. Uh, I'll give you just a little bit about Cook. It started by Bill Cook in the 70s. Oh, thank you. In the spare bedroom of his apartment in 1963, and it was based on a concept called percutaneous entry, which means that a hole heals faster than a cook, and I'm sure your devices are basically minimal invasive or based on that. He was the first one to take to the medical profession the three things. That was a needle, a wire, and a catheter. And from that, the industry, uh, device industries exploded, and we've sort of followed that growth in the industry. We manufacture over 15,000 devices. 
14,750 of them have less than a million dollar market worldwide. Uh, we have manufacturing in, uh, in outside of San Diego and Bloomington, Spencer, Indiana, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Pittsburgh, uh, Ireland, Denmark, and Australia have direct sales throughout the world, um, except in those places where there's subsistence medicine and it's not sufficient to justify having uh, direct sales, and we use distributors there, so we cover 160 different countries. 80% um, of our devices are manufactured in the United States, 50% uh, of our sales are United States, and 50% outside the United States. That used to be 75% in the United States and 25% outside. It's growing rapidly outside the internationally, and so we anticipate we'll be 75 percent international and 25 percent uh, in the United States uh, in the very near future. Um, we have about 10,000 employees worldwide. Um, I, th <clears throat> I think to sort of illustrate what we've just heard, um, we used to introduce 100 percent of our devices in the United States first. So the first place we marketed was in the United States. Now we introduce, uh, and our people came up with one that we introduced in the United States first. So it's essentially 100 percent are introduced internationally first and then brought back to the United States. And you have to do that because in a competitive market, you've got a competitive market. You've got to go where you can be first to market. Once you establish yourself in the international market in both sales and approvals, then manufacturing stays. So what you're having is all new devices are available to patients uh, outside the United States two to three years and even more ahead of that. But secondly, all the growth in, in, your, uh, in your new manufacturing and employment is outside the United States. Now you combine <laughs> that as a combination of things, and one is the obviously our, our regulatory system, and I, I don't want to direct that at individuals at the FDA, but the systemic system needs to be changed and needs to be corrected. Uh, we've got a list of suggestions here that we uh, would forward it on to you. Uh, the second thing that's driving that is obviously the device tax, which makes our effective in the United States tax for us about 55 percent. When you take the federal tax, you take the excise tax and you take the state taxes that are uh, applicable to that. In Ireland, for instance, you start with 35 percent in the United States and 12 and a half in Ireland. Uh, to be competitive, that's a tremendous driver in terms of, of your cost. So not only do you have a regulatory system, but now you've compounded it with a tax system that gives them incentives. The third thing that is there is the fact you don't repatriate funds. You know, we're at the point where 50 percent of our devices are sold outside the United States. Uh, profit is outside the United States. The money's there. Now you've given an incentive not to bring it back, but in fact leave it over there. And as he said, we're an American company. We just opened a new plant in, in uh, Canton, Illinois, because we wanted to help a, a small town. And we were thinking about doing that across the country, these small plants of various places employing about 300 people. But all incentives are driving us outside the United States. I mean, it, uh, if you're trying to destroy an industry, you're doing a very good job of it. And if you want my opinion on that, if that's not direct enough, I, I, I could be more direct. Uh, finally, um, the study by Avonmed had, and it showed 10 percent, if you have 10 percent decline, uh, you eliminate about 43,000 jobs. From the CEOs that I'm talking to, uh, you know, you're looking at a 30 percent decline, which is 120 to 146,000 jobs. Uh, and we need to change the system. So I'll be happy to answer any specific questions, but that sort of gives you an overview. Uh, I hope you didn't miss our opinion <laughs> <laughs> on this. <laughs> Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, my name is Rick Packer. I'm uh, lucky enough to be the leader of Zoll Medical. Uh, Zoll Medical is about a $500 million company. Um, our single concentration is resuscitation, that being trying to get people to survive a sudden cardiac arrest. So we're best known for defibrillators, but we have uh, many other technologies that you deploy in order to bring someone back from a sudden cardiac arrest. We have about 1,800 employees. Uh, we have major facilities here in the United States in Massachusetts, where I'm based. 
in Pittsburgh, in uh, Sunnyvale, uh, out in California, as well as in Broomfield, Colorado. We make 100 percent of our product in the United States, as do most of the resuscitation industry comes from the United States. And it really shows what a jewel this industry is to the world and to our economy. Uh, building in the United States, as uh, Steve has just pointed out, is a choice that CEOs make. And we're able to make that choice uh, when we can. And when we are under duress, um, we have to choose to go to uh, other places outside the United States. And as I look at our industry, I've only been in the industry for about 20 years. I know Steve's been in the industry for 45 or 50 or a little bit longer, so he's got a better history. But um, I've never seen our industry under so much stress and um, really a jewel of an industry that is going to evaporate here based on choices that we are making within our, co our country. Um, we are probably the largest net exporting industry given how little product we bring into the United States and how much product we put out into the rest of the world. And between slowdowns in the FDA uh, needing to get products approved so that we can sell our products in countries that have the country of origin law, such as China, Brazil, Mexico, where you can't move products into those countries that come from the United States unless you're already through the FDA process. Um, the medical device tax, which in my case will take my effective corporate rate, not including state rate, to 60 percent. Um, and local regulations that I face in the state of Massachusetts, which has some novel views of their medical device industry, uh, it is not a pleasant industry to be in right now. And we love this industry. We love what we do for patients. Most of us could go into a different line of work and do quite well. We're in this business because we like patients. Uh, we want to help them. And it's getting very difficult to do that. Uh, and next, John Friel, right, recently thanks. retired from CEO of MedRag. MedRag, that's right. Yeah, my name's John Friel. I'm retired CEO now, uh, but I was part of the team that built MedRag from a startup to uh, over $700 million in revenue business. Uh, we have three manufacturing locations in the Pittsburgh area, uh, two near Minneapolis. Uh, over 95 percent of our products are manufactured here in the United States, at, at least for now. Um, Forty percent of the sales are exported outside of the United States. For the Pennsylvania members, 99 percent of our sales are outside of Pennsylvania. We have 2,400 employees. Uh, 400 of those are overseas, so there's about 2,000 here in the United States, about 1,500 in the, in the western Pennsylvania area. MedRad's a two-time recipient of the Malcolm Baldrige Performance Excellence Award. That's an award that's uh, presented by the President of the United States for uh, business excellence. I'm the uh, former chair of the Pittsburgh Technology Council, and currently I'm on the board of two uh, medical startup companies uh, in the Pittsburgh area. I'm going to reiterate uh, what you've heard. Uh, first of all, on the tax. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really not that hard to understand. Uh, when you're running a business, medical device business, uh, you have your revenues, the, the costs associated with it, you have your margins, profit you need to produce, and then what we're all faced with is making investment decisions. Uh, you go through your annual budgeting process, team presents various projects. You have choices to make for investments. And so far, fortunately, we had more choices than we had funds available to do that. So it's, you got to make, you got to prioritize. And when that bucket of funds you have available to invest, when it is decreased by taxes and funds that, that are, you're forced to put into bureaucracy, it's, it's simple math. It just doesn't go into new product development market expansion, and infrastructure, which is where we want to be spending our money on innovation, expanding markets, improving the quality of our operations. That's, that's what you want to be investing in. Now, you've got relatively big companies here from the vantage point that I have with the uh, Pittsburgh Tech Council. And this excise tax on the small companies 
is is going to be devastating. Uh, there, the, it it is a tax on revenue. So whether they're generating profits or not, uh, Alex talked about being funded by the uh, Kleiner Perkins venture capital. These venture capitalists that are putting money into innovative technology, companies can't get funded. It, it's that simple. They can't get funded if. If they're not going to make any money and they got to pay this tax, whether they're making money or not, so the, the venture capitalists are just saying, "Well, we can put our money into this company. It's not going to go to develop new products. It's going to go straight to pay this tax." Well, they they also have choices to make where they're going to invest. So the, the, these these new innovative uh, smaller companies, Alex's story is going to be tougher and tougher uh, to start. All of us started out. You mentioned Bill Cook, and I, and I know Rick with Zola and the, the MedRed story. At one time, we were all small. <laughs> Started up in the in the garage in the in the in the kitchen. I mean, that's how these businesses start. Um, just yesterday, I was at a meeting uh, with the Pittsburgh Life Sciences greenhouse. So yesterday morning, before I drove down here, and uh, we're talking about there are three companies, three startup companies now in in Pittsburgh, in Western Pennsylvania, that are moving their clinical trials outside of the United States because the, uh, the predictability, the consistency, the, the transparency issues that they face with the FDA, they're being driven to go elsewhere. One is going to India, one is going to South Africa, and one's going to Brazil. And the discussion we were having yesterday was I was being informed that these companies are now talking about establishing their operations there. They've got their clinicals going. They've got their key uh, medical advisors they're working with. They need to generate revenue to keep their investors uh, happy. And the fastest path to revenue is in the markets to make it where it's easier for them to do business. And now they're talking about setting up their manufacturing operations there. So in the long haul, what we're going to do here is all of our innovation is going to be moving outside the country. And the incentives are, are there to, to move outside and get set up somewhere else. And then it's tough to come back in, and then you're generating profits. Now you've got profits, and if you want to bring them back, you get penalized if you're going to bring them back. So what do you do? It just makes sense. You're going to invest then. And, and it's not like these uh, countries are not, provide, not after you to do it, right? I mean, we're in competition. This country is in competition for these jobs with these other countries, and they make it easy to do business with, and we're making it tough to do business with. What do you think is going to happen? It's not that hard to figure out. So I, I better watch out. I'll join Steve with my... Uh... <laughs> that was a good, excellent comment. Uh, and we all love to hear the stories of these startups, these small that have served over the years. That's okay. <laughs> Our very important whip. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, one, I, I want to thank you all for coming. And um, you lay out a very um, sad scenario, but a very true one. If I, I just want to touch on the three main factors that I hear. One comes from the FDA. I mean, if it's four years added more to America than it is in Europe, you see a direct correlation of where people go. Repatriation that you continue to strive to be an American company and we punish you for doing it. So what it tells you is to leave your, comp your money offshores and not invest it back in to here or invest it back in your company. And the third was the device tax. Now all of you already uh, are a company up and running, so one of the greatest things in your industry has always been innovation. And the, gr the greatest success of your innovation has always been to the patient of uh, the health care of the individual. Now, America's always prided themselves on being the innovative ones, but it looks like long term we will soon no longer be the case. What I want to touch first on what Alex talked about because my daughter had back surgery, and I know fundamentally she was face down in surgery, and it was quite a few days before she could get up. You say they walked directly out 
outpatient surgery, which is just shocking to me. I got to come down and visit it. I just want to touch more on what can we do as members with the FDA to enhance transparency or what are we lacking that can uh, keep our innovation going? Sure. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I think the one thing that you hear a lot about are the, the moving goalposts. And, and what that means is that you pre-agree with FDA on a particular clinical protocol, and you go down that pathway and you perform everything that has to happen before you do the clinicals and then the clinicals and so forth. And as you get through that process, which you get potentially from FDA, and this has happened to my company repeatedly, not just once, is, is a, um, a going backwards and saying, well, actually, you know, we'd like to see some additional biomechanical testing. And so you get that done, and now you're ready to go, and you've signed all the check boxes now, and then it's, well, how about something else? And the reason that it's happening is, is I think, multifaceted. One is that um, there's, there's reviewers at the FDA that are not very well trained, and there's a very high turnover rate. And I think that that's part of what happens is that they don't seem to understand what they're asking for in many situations. Um, and a lot of times they're just not caught up on really the state of medicine and, and what's appropriate. And so uh, they'll ask for controls and for things that really are impossible for surgeons to accomplish. So I, I think first and foremost would be getting the reviewers trained um, and getting them really well trained. Um, that would help us a great deal. And then making sure that things survive your, the life cycle of the approval process, because these are long life cycles. When you, when you get in to get a product approved, it can take you anywhere from two to three to four or five or six years. So if you agree on a particular protocol, you can't have that changed in three years or in four years. I mean, if there's a safety concern, yes, of course, but these aren't usually safety concerns, and it's very hard to tell from a clinical perspective what it is, in fact, that FDA really wants. And so, you know, those are big issues, as well as the fact that a lot of times you simply don't get any information back from FDA until it's very late in the game. Well, you're still spending money on R&D, you're spending money on planning for commercialization, and then all of a sudden you have to stop everything. And that's happened to us as recently as this year with a number of products. Um, I, I think they have to take very seriously the impact that they have on a company. Yes, they have to look at safety and efficacy, but I don't think a reviewer should have the power to, to essentially ask for whatever that he or she wishes from a company when it can lead to spending a hell of a lot more money to get the test done and potentially even bankrupting a company. So those are some of the things that I think just coming out of the chute that, that could be addressed. Just one last question. I'd like to go to Steve on the Cook Medical. Do you find the same thing? Is, is it getting the reviewers up to speed or... Because you, you all are so innovative, is it difficult where you're knowing more than what you're going through the reviewer, they don't even have the process? I mean, what's the challenge in the FDA? Um, I agree with everything he said. I, I agree with everything he said, so, and we've got examples of exactly the same thing. Um, I, I think that in direct answer to your question, the FDA is never going to know as much as we do. But what they need is a system, so they don't need to know as much. So that we establish for them the appropriate uh, basis for approval of devices. And that is, takes some training and confidence into it. I think the FDA needs to quit being defensive and defending who they are and look at ways to solve the problem. Uh, I think that Congress needs to set priorities for them and say these are things that you no longer need to be doing. Let's get out of that and apply those resources to the reviews that you need to do. And so I think somebody needs to set priorities for them. I think it's hard for them to do that. Um, I, there's a whole list, but I, I think our system basically is pretty good. You know, you've got class three devices and it's a risk-based system. So you ought to have more review at class three, class two, last, class one, and then you have exempt devices. You need to rely upon good manufacturing practice and good uh, inspections. You need to have inspections where we don't have European inspectors and et cetera, et cetera. We ought to have one international system for inspection um, and good manufacturing. We ought to rely more on international standards where everybody agrees that's the standard. You shouldn't have to reprove something. He comes in and proves something to, to be valid. We shouldn't have to. 
Now, then that's an industry fight, but I, it, it, you're on the governmental side and resource side. It doesn't make any sense for us to redo it, to redo animal tests, to redo tests that another company's already done. If it's already been established, if it's no one, it's no one. You know, and that we've been in this fight for 15 years on that and have gone through very, but we never made that resource saving progress. The FDA needs to look for alternative sources. You know, we're all caught up in to the double blind, you know, progress uh, studies. But there are a lot of things in this day that technology will establish for you. You don't have to have animals. You know, think of all the animals that we test and we run through that aren't necessary in, in the human testing, you know. Um, so I think they need to look at historic trials, databases, other systems to look rather than the double-blinded study. I don't think it's an appropriate. Boy, I'm going to kill this thing, I think. <laughs> I'm a little passionate about what I'm having to say in case you missed it. Um, and obviously you need to have a predictable system. There's no reason if we send man to the moon you can't have the best system that works efficiently and have the approval times the least in the United States of any place else in the world. Uh, you expect the industry to produce a predictable product consistently and get it to patients, and you've got a system that's approving that that is not predictable, it's not consistent, it has none of the qualities that they expect us to meet. And if both sides of that equation are the same in terms of predictability, consistency, and getting good product, then we're going to get to a point where we have. You need to change the classification system. I think. Congress needs to say it's simple. Every year you publish those things that you down classify. It's a risk-based system. You know, cardiovascular um, catheters are well-known. Technology, materials, testing, it's true of everybody's industry here. Down classify them. You know, when it's a known material, when it's a known process, down classify it and get us all out of the PMA process and the high risk process. Let's move predictability down. Um, obviously, training has to be part of every organization. Everybody gets turnover. We all get turnover. Uh, you know, we all pass on. So you've got to have training and consistency, but you've got to be trained about the, the right, right things. Um, I, I think, too, that when we, we look at this and we're, we get off into these side things, like when to file 510K, you know, and that's sort of been a big issue. It was back 15 years ago. For some companies, that's not a big issue. For us, with 15,000 devices, it's enormous. We make three to 4,000 process changes in the complies with GMP, we document, et cetera, in one plan alone every year. If we have to file a 510K on that, we shut us down or we shut the FDA down. There's no way to handle it. We went through those discussions 15 years ago, and now it's renewing, but that's a really dangerous thing to start moving that question of when you file a 510K. And the best place for judgment is not here in Washington. It's by ins good inspections, by coming into the plant, looking at the way we document, looking at our verifications, our testing to establish that. You don't need to have uh, pre-approval out here. And I think those are all areas in which, I, I think there are a lot of areas. He mentioned the IDE area, which is constant problem. The rules change, they change what they want, what they expect. You get a new reviewer and you got to go back and start over. We, we have one device that we started on 2005, you know, <laughs> and here we are redoing it uh, now. And uh, we've got a lot of, you know, that are behind, but some of them just get to be uh, beyond uh, reason in terms of what's there. And once again, I don't want to go back and blame the people because I don't think it's people. I think it's a, a system. We, it's a structural system that we've got to get corrected, and it takes action at FDA and from Congress to do it. I appreciate that, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to go to the chairman of the Health Subcommittee, Joe Pitts. Thank you, uh, Kathy, for arranging this uh, forum on medical devices and jobs and job loss and creation. And I want to thank the, uh, the leaders of the medical device industry for coming today. I, I want to say that uh, I know many device companies felt like they couldn't participate today uh, for fear of retaliation by the FDA. 
and with the important 510K and the PMA applications pending, they felt like they couldn't take the risk that FDA m might retaliate against them. And I want to assure you, and I'm sure the other members agree, that if we get even a hint of FDA retaliation, we will take the proper action. Um, there have been studies, a recent study by the California Healthcare Institute and the Boston Consulting Group found that in 2004, the European Union approved applications for new medical devices on average about 14.2 months sooner than the United States, a gap that policymakers should have aimed to close. But in the last six years, the difference in approval time has only grown worse. By 2010, the EU process was 46.8 months faster, meaning that the U.S. now lags by almost four years compared to the Europeans. First of all, why does it take so much longer here in the United States? And, and what does this mean to our U.S. companies, to our U.S. patients, and what can we do about it? John? Well, uh, I think it's what it means for us, for our patients, and for the, the country. I think it, it's fairly obvious. It means our patients aren't getting uh, advanced uh, medical treatment as fast as the rest of the world. And what it means is what we've been saying, that the, the jobs that are associated with developing innovative medical devices are going to be uh, moving overseas. The, the, the issue at the FDA um, uh, for a lot of companies is that it's already been mentioned, Steve talked about it. It, it. It's the idea of predictability and consistency and transparency. We're all in business. We all have no problem whatsoever with making safe, efficacious medical devices. That's exactly what we want to do, and we want to be really good at it, because we have to be really good at it, but there's no question that we want safe, efficacious devices. And we don't mind having a system that we need to, to sh prove and show, and there, there's, there's room for regulatory oversight. That's not a problem either. But what we need is a system that actually works. That's what we need to, to operate in. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the consistency, the, the, uh, the predictability of it, the so-called moving goalposts. When you, when, you, when you set something up, a plan, and you're exe to, executing to the plan, and you're devoting your resources, and in the middle of it, someone changes the rules on you, it's hard to be 46 months ahead of the competition. That's the stuff that pushes you consistently pushes you further behind. We'll make safe, efficacious devices that help improve patient lives and save lives. That you can count on. And we can innovate and we can do it here in the United States. That you can count on. We don't mind having a system. We need a system that works. Steve, you mentioned international standards. Where's the opposition coming from against relying on international standards? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure there's ever opposition. There's just a lack of uh, moving forward with uh, international standards, as I think we should in this country. Uh, we, the FDA participates along with industry on various international standard organizations, but we need to be willing to follow through and put them in place uh, is, is what I'd say to that. I think that's an important part. The more you can have standards, uh, that everybody agrees to, then the less you have to establish. And all you have to do is certify that, in fact, we comply with that standard. And so that the more you can get those, those standards established, the faster the process will work. Rick, did you or Alex want to add anything? Well, you know, I personally think that as Americans, we often believe that we are smarter than the rest of the world, and so there is a certain homegrown mentality that we have that our way is the best way, and perhaps we're not as open-minded to alternative ways of doing things, such as harmonizing with international standards. I think one of the biggest things that you as um, people in Congress could do is to help the FDA keep in balance risk and reward. The difference with the European system is that Risk-reward is very much in balance, and uh, they recognize that not everything is perfect, although we strive to make everything perfect. 
Uh, and if there is a tremendous upside for patients, then we will take some risk. In certain political environments, the FDA gets very, very risk averse. They are very averse to coming before Congress and having to explain why such and such a device didn't work perfectly every time. And I think culturally that weighs down um, the agency and, and acts to really seize it up, and that's what we've seen over the last four years or so, where people are just afraid to make a decision. It's, it's safe if you don't put a product on the market. No one can ever second guess your decision. But what people don't see is the benefit that we've lost by not getting the product on the market. So in some ways, helping the FDA um, to be comfortable taking risk, understanding that its mission, part of its mission is innovation and getting the best medical technology out um, would certainly help the situation. Thank you. You know, I think as far as um, Europe is concerned and talking about the CE mark, the, the CE mark is, a, is an excellent system. And, and I think in part it's excellent because it's really a market-driven system. So as you go through and you get your approvals, what you're really focused on is safety and reproducibility. Efficacy is ultimately decided by the market. It's decided by the user, whether that's a surgeon or a patient. And if they don't like your product that much, for whatever reason, it's simply not used. Whereas I think in the U.S., it's the opposite. We're trying to sort of see the whole process all the way through, um, and it's unnecessary. Uh, there's a lot of devices that are somewhat similar, and uh, they come down to small nuances that will be more preferable to one user versus another and the market should decide those things. That's in part why that whole system, and I thought Steve did a nice job explaining it, in Europe is so much better because it's completely transparent. It's a little bit more expensive to us as device manufacturers. Uh, the, the fee's a little bit higher when you apply for it, which we don't care because it's maybe you know, 10,000 versus 7,000 on a 510K. But, but the reality is things happen according to a schedule. Things happen the way they're supposed to happen, and when you're done with the process, you're done. There's no renegotiating and, and, and so on. So I, I think that the European system has a lot to offer in terms of its philosophical orientation that we could apply to, to FDA and to, to echo Rick's remarks, you know, really make it more risk averse. There's not a problem with devices, as, as we know, as, as, as you just said. Um, they're 99.9 percent .9 safe. And so all of these added layers that we're forcing companies to do accomplish next to nothing. Again, thank you, Kathy, for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Bass. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. This is a really interesting session. I am not on the Health Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and I understand that, bo uh, that both the Health Subcommittee and the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee have addressed this issue. Um, it's particularly interesting and important to me because it just so happens that my state and district have a significant number of medical device manufacturers um, accounting for, if I can read my crib here, here we are, about 3,800 jobs, about almost $200 million uh, in, uh, in uh, payroll and $760 million in medical device sales. We're one of the top 10 states in the nation in this area. The average salary of an employee is $40,000 a year, and the growth of the industry is about 7.5 percent. You can imagine how thrilled these guys are with the medical device tax. Um, but the FDA is another significant issue, and it's, it's, it's somewhat shocking to hear my friend from Pennsylvania's uh, testimony about the fact that the length of time that it takes to get a medical device uh, approved by the FDA is now close to four years. Um, and yet in, uh, as, uh, in significantly lo uh, uh, longer than uh, European nations. We've discussed here uh, many of the questions that I was planning to ask, but I would throw out a concept, at least, that perhaps we should, uh, uh, over and above establishing international standards, what about setting something to the European standard, i.e., uh, the simplest would be if, if, if a medical device is approved by the euro, then something happens here automatically, perhaps not completely approved and marketed, but somewhere at some point your the process becomes significantly easier. Now this is a little bit of a cop out because that means that you go to Europe to get your approval because our system is broken. We in Congress ought to be fixing it. So um, if uh, we did get some ideas from you all about how we could go about fixing it at the regulatory level, uh, what about 
tying something to a well-known successful process whereby medical devices have been successfully um, approved and don't seem to be creating problems. Anybody want to address that? Well, I would just jump in and say that <clears throat> I think that's the whole point to harmonization and to, to really making that work. I, you know, we're faced with that, and I'm sure Cook is too. I know they have a big presence in Asia Pacific, but we have to deal with the Japanese FDA and the Chinese FDA and so on and so forth, getting our, our products out there. So I think if there were, um, and I think Steve made a good point about really down classifying certain devices, mm -hmm. so that once they get to a certain level of they've been in the market for a long period of time, by down classifying them, it really, it really lowers the hurdle. It makes it more competitive, without question. I think there's larger companies that might say, well, we don't really want that because we want to maintain more control. But I think if you look at it from a purely objective fashion, it would be better for everybody because it would mean more devices and potentially that would lower costs uh, for healthcare overall, so it would be more competition. Uh, I would favor an approach like that, um, and I think that's what we need. I mean, I think it's the right direction. Um, and I, th I think specifically in the clinical trial area, if you run your clinical trials and you've had a standard, and this is one we struggle with all the time, is if we've run the clinical trials over there, then use them as a basis for approval here. And it, it's an issue we struggle with that needs, I think, to be firmed up because I think that's an important issue and vice versa. But the second thing is we're really getting the system complicated in the United States in terms of all the approval that necessary to run clinical trials. And that's what another thing that keeps forcing us over there. By the time you go through not only the FDA approval and then you gotta go through the local approval and then you go through our privacy and the regs go on and on and on. And so we're making it really difficult for us to run clinical trials here. And I think a look at what could encourage and streamline that process all the way from the FDA down to the informed consent would be very helpful uh, that you don't have to deal with in the European system. So I would do the two things. Uh, I think the third thing I'd add on there, if you've got an inspection under one, let's don't re-inspect. That ought to be a standard inspection, and they ought to get that worked out with and be directed to do that. So that if you use a third-party inspection and, and it's European, then it's good over here, vice versa. FDA doesn't have to send somebody over. They don't have to send somebody over here. I, so I'd sure get the inspection issue uh, clarified. Okay. And then it's been working for years, but they haven't ever got to where you have one form that you file, uh, an international form for the approval, and it sort of goes back and forth. And we've tried to help by filing that, and it, it, it it's just not um, it's just not getting there. So. I like your idea. I, then I immediately got into the trench on you mm -hmm. from the <laughs> from the big concept. So, but. does the just one last follow up? Does the medical device industry have some kind of an association that could come up with? Could can you guys agree on what needs to be done? If if not, could you get? Is there any kind of consensus that we could get for the two or three top priorities for speeding up the regulatory process that? you guys feel minimizes the, uh, uh, the potential for, for issues, serious negative issues with the FDA. When you struggle with things, nothing gets done. You've got to solve these problems. And, and I can see what's happening here because we're, they're complex and you, and you get into the trenches quickly, you don't come up with any consensus. And if there's a way for the, for the manufacturers or to, 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 to start with the simple stuff, and give us four or five different ideas that we might be able to tr to, to work on. So there are- You haven't done it already. Yeah, so there are two industry associations, okay. Advamed, which is typically with the bigger companies, and MDMA, which is typically the smaller companies. And I think on the FDA, the two organizations can agree on what the top priorities are. And we would uh, look forward to giving you uh, that list and giving us the opportunity to make it uh, a short list of this is the things that we think ought to be attacked. Yeah, I, and I think on your desk there you have a suggestion from Cook on what they could okay. be in the 
framework, and we've had some of these discussions like that. The only thing that I caution you on, I, I think some of the things I've mentioned, too, is because you get into the, the protectiveness of using the system to protect things. At some point in time, I think Congress just needs to step over the industry protection issue and solve the resource issue for them by changing the system. Reclassification might be one. You know, use of what the FDA already knows, that's, a, that's an inter-industry battle. But I think for resources of the FDA, let us compete on even, don't get into setting up the, uh, the priorities of the non-competition. So I'd, I'd put a, there's a list there that I'd say we could all agree on, and then there's a list that's going to break down, and the Congress just needs to make those decisions. Chairman. Okay, good. Do we have any time constraints at this end of the table here? Okay, well, then I was just going to... <laughs> okay, well, I think we'll be okay. We'll just move around to uh, Brett Guthrie from Kentucky. Thanks a lot. What got me interested in this is just the innovation. I was thinking probably 20-something years ago, somebody came in one day and said, uh, boy, if we do a gallbladder surgery this way instead of three or four days in the hospital and six weeks at home, if you come in early in the morning and get it done that day and get a good night's sleep, you go to work tomorrow. Everybody probably said, well, that's crazy. That'll never happen, and it happens every day, every day now. So my concern is as, as we make your industry less attractive to invest in, it becomes less attractive to innovate and create the product. What a tremendous productivity to have somebody at work the next day instead of six weeks off just in general for society. And you're talking about your bucket, and I think as this town's now, or part of this town's aflame with trying to raise taxes on innovators and job creators, you know, your bucket, you take out of your bucket and give, you don't have any to invest. And the people who, and, and so we bring high profile examples, you know, billionaire investors or, or Fortune 5 companies, but the people who are really struggling with this are the people trying to grow their business. It's not mature businesses or mature investing businesses, it's, it's people really, and the people trying to mature their businesses are the people trying to hire people and put people to work and train people. And Rick, you said you had a 60% effective tax rate. Now, we know some companies pay at a 0% effective tax rate. And that's what people talk about all the time. But you have a sit. What, how does that make up? What's your 60% comprising? So, so if the medical device tax was in place for 2010, I would have an effective 60% corporate tax rate. So Because that's all on revenue instead it's of It's on income. revenue, and I would add that to the 30% that I would have with whatever profits that are left. And mm -hmm. if I divide that by the total profits, it's about 60%. So you have... Uh, you essentially pay over 30% effective tax rate. Yes. I mean, we're a little bit lower than the corporate rate because we add a lot of jobs. Most of our companies are high tech, so right. the R&D tax credit helps our industry. But you're not close industry. to zero. No, no, no. And, if and I can figure out problem. how to do it, I would. <laughs> no. but. What's the, you know, that's the problem that, that we, we're just trying to stress is that as people are trying to position this as us against them, it's really about all of us. It's about, are we going to have businesses in this country that grow, increase, particularly the growing businesses, the ones out looking for people to work, going to the universities, trying to find engineers, trying to find high-tech people to repair your equipment, not just, I mean, blue-collar high-tech people. And uh, that's just going to be punished in this if we don't uh, change the attitude of, of part of this town because uh, you, can, you can point to high-profile names all you want and point to the Fortune 400, but I mean, we're talking about people trying to not only grow your businesses and create a product, but changing people's lives. I mean, I just first I've heard of yours, people can have spine surgery and be back out walking the next day, maybe, maybe two days later. So the thing to think about for the device industry, to your point, Congressman, is 95% of our companies are less than $100 million. So the four companies sitting around this table are not representative of our industry. Um, we can survive the medical device tax. I mean, Zoll Medical will move production offshore to lower our costs so that I can afford that tax, and I will cut back on R&D to afford that tax. But we're big enough that we'll, we'll survive it. Mm -hmm. The 95% the that are under $100 million, typically today, $100 million is about where the break-even point is for medical device companies. So most of these are immediately going to go underwater due to the medical device tax, and that's really where the jobs are being created. I just want to make one more point, and, and uh, I know uh, Lee said he had a place to go, so I want to make sure he has his time. But my understanding is this. I mean, you're, <laughs> the, um, I mean, you're a high-tech, high-manufacturing, probably high-wage, I would guess, 
because you have to have technical people, industry, and manufacturing. You know, a lot of people in this town talk about that, and they talk about it in terms of environmental jobs. But, but these are the kind of jobs that, that we're talking about. My understanding is uh, Europe actually has a strategy. It wasn't just that Europe's easier to get approved. They actually had a strategy, just like Kentucky tries to compete with Nebraska to get jobs, and so we try to be more innovative and try to send people out. They actually sat down and said, we're going to make this a streamlined process because if we do it and we make it more acceptable for people to approve in a safe way, then they're going to locate in our, it's not just that Europe's easier, Europe actually has an economic development strategy. So my question is, the FDA has to know this? Or are they, are they saying, yeah, we acknowledge it's a problem, we just can't figure out how to solve it? Or do they think there's not a problem? I'm just I'm interested in that perspective. So, so we sat last, a number of us last week across the table from Margaret Humberg, the head of the FDA, and Jeff Shuren, the head of the device portion of the FDA, and they acknowledge that there are problems. Um, they seem to believe that they're all resource related. Our industry doesn't agree with that because we've seen the resource expand in uh, the device section fairly heavily without a commensurate improvement in performance. They know that there are problems. They know that jobs are at stake. Um, they don't seem to have a handle on how to get to where they want to get to as well. Well, thanks. I'll put that. I'll yield back. <laughs> Senior member of Energy and Commerce here, Lee Terry. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Yes. Uh, Joe uh, chaired the o, uh, combined O and I and uh, Health Subcommittee, and Mr. Sharon was in front of us. And uh, Brett, he said right up front, "We've got problems, and we've set out a matrix, and we're looking. You know, we're going to measure our progress and." Uh, so they understand they have a problem, but I would agree with you, Rick. Uh, they think it's all resource-based and not really uh, focused on lack of strategy. Uh, they did mention their turnover problem, uh, which raises uh, one of my questions, and that's uh, in regard to getting through the process. Is there a way that we can meet the standard set, the goalposts, the 100 yards, you know how to get there, and it could be reviewed by a competent, reliable, trustworthy third party outside of the FDA? For example, when we did our uh, consumer protection bill of toys coming from China, which turned out to be everything, uh, we wrote in they could be verified by third-party entities. Is there something like that out there uh, to make the process more reliable? Rick, anybody? Steve? So, so I think it's actually a little bit simpler than that, Congressman. Really? Uh, I, and I think Alex can speak to that. I think all Alex would like to do is have a meeting come to some agreement, even if he doesn't agree with the FDA, have the FDA say, here's the goalpost, and he'll go execute to that goalpost. Most of the time, the argument isn't where the goalpost is. There may be a complaint, but that's not the killer. It's when you do all that work and then you come back. So we would love to get a system where the FDA just documents this is what we told the company, and if the company achieves that, we're good to go. It's exactly right. I mean, this is not rocket science to fix this. And, you know, I think there's, you know, you asked about what are the three main points. Well, the three main points, number one, is to stop the moving goalposts. And that can be done. I mean, that's just a matter of, of administration. That's a matter of tone. It's a matter of culture. It's a matter of being very clear that we don't do that as an FDA. There's no reason to do that to you arbitrarily. I mean, that, that's number one. The second one is what I talked about in, in the opening, which is the reviewer expertise. Um, if you don't have expertise, you're constantly going back and forth. And so that can be done easily, too, in terms of outside consultants. You know, I mentioned before in the same meeting that Rick and I were at last week that industry would be delighted to provide various educational forums for FDA specific to areas of cardiovascular, orthopedics, hips, knees, bring in the top experts, the top surgeons. We would do that on our own dime because it would be better for us and for everyone else to train them. 
Um, we're not trying to taint them with regard to how we see the world, simply train them on what's happened. And I think that's always the fear at FDA that, you know, well, we can't have a company train us. But if we simply yeah. went down that, that path. They'd say that's the fox uh, yeah, training the security for the hen house. Yeah, but, but it's really the surgeons that are practicing medicine that are training. Well, the and that's why I thought maybe there's so, a third party of experts out there because, um, no offense, Alex, but the culture there is so entrenched, yes. and I don't believe they can change. I really don't. So, so well, and I don't necessarily I think they are inher or, or, or incompetent to the core. Well, the, the third point I was going to make is accountability and making sure that they stick to the timelines. So, if there's an oversight process to ensure that those top three things are met, however that's done, whether it's internal or ex external. Those are the three things that, that we need, so that there's not what's called clock manipulation by the FDA of starting and restarting clocks on submissions and so on and so forth, which drags things out. Well, I appreciate that. And just two quick points. The other thing that disturbed me most and probably shook uh, the, my confidence most significantly was the fact that uh, there was a witness that was brought in that's uh, editor from a major medical uh, magazine, review magazine, that just bashed the European approval process and basically said it wasn't competent, you can't use their data, you can't use, you said 3,000 surgeries done over there, uh, but you can't use that because the data is unreliable. Uh, it seems to me that you guys don't think the European model is that unreliable as the conclusion that I've come to from all of you today. Um, and the fact that Jeff uh, Sharon in no way uh, refuted that witness, in fact, associated himself with part of it. So they have an inherent belief over there that only the U.S. can do it, that the European system is not up to their standards to the point where they'll trust anything from Europe. I think that's another thing that's got to change. Rick, you brought up another one of my questions, the R&D tax credit. Uh, if that went away, because we've heard plans that say we're going to take away all these special interest tax credits, which I assume that would mean research and development. Uh, what would that do to your effective tax rate? Um, so it would probably move our effective tax rate four or five points, so it's not nearly as devastating as the medical device, device tax, for sure. Um, if you want a high-tech industry, um, such as ours or others, to thrive within our country, Focusing at R&D is a good idea, generally. Would agree. All right, Kathy, I appreciate it. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, Mr. Lance from New Jersey. Uh, thank you, Kathy, and, and thank you for chairing this important uh, uh, discussion. Um, we in New Jersey have at least uh, 22,000 jobs directly related to the industry uh, and 40,000 other jobs in related fields. The district I serve has more medical device and pharmaceutical employees than any other district in the United States, and certainly we are among the medicine chests of the world, and we would like to think one of the leading ones. It's my observation that those who work in the industry are obviously involved in high technology, good paying jobs, and also uh, those who are active in their communities in other ways, with Boy Scouts, with churches, with PTAs. This is not a smokestack industry, and it is the type of constituent I think we would all like to see and to encourage to have greater employment. Uh, I, I am particularly concerned um, with the uh, medical device uh, attacks. I, I, I do not understand intellectually uh, attacks on, uh, on revenue. I, I just don't understand it. I don't understand it intellectually. It bears no relationship to profits. It's not clear to me that the American people recognize that this is going to occur, number one. And number two, if you explain to the average person in the street that there would be a tax on, not on a profit of a company, but on a revenue, I, I, I think the people would overwhelmingly be opposed to it. It also impresses me as being a vicious circle. Uh, less uh, research and development is the result of, of this uh, horrible tax and more jobs uh, moving uh, overseas. Uh, one of the companies in the district I serve 
has indicated that payment of this tax would, in effect, eliminate uh, what it can afford for R&D. Just a vicious circle. Uh, Mr. Friel, can, can, you, can you explain in a little greater detail how, how the tax would be harmful to, to your company personally? It, it's, it's not a whole lot of detail. <laughs> it raises the effective tax rate. Uh, a tax on revenues, as you said, bears no relationship to the profitability. No, no relationship. None whatsoever. And uh, it's going to directly, directly, we will, we will make choices to invest. We, we will not be investing mm -hmm. in innovation, market development, market expansion, and infrastructure development. We will not do that because those funds that otherwise would have been spent on those activities are going to go to paying the tax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's that simple. So the innovation will lead to uh, fewer innovation, uh, less jobs, less jobs, fewer right? jobs, and, and f of course, this will be detrimental to the health of the American people and, and to people across the world. That's right. That's right. Eventually, you know, fewer jobs, you have less innovation, and as you said, it's a, it becomes a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. We're we are going to yeah. purposefully, with our eyes wide open, do something that's going to negatively impact innovation. And, and for this country, as you know, we're, we're not going to be competing with the world as the low-cost mm -hmm. labor mm -hmm. country. For us to compete in this world, we're going to have to compete with our smarts. We're going to compete with innovation. 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 That is the key. It's the key for our company. We have a lot of Chinese competitors. Mm -hmm. We have six Chinese competitors. We're not going to beat them on cost of their labor. Of course not. We're going to beat them on our innovation. I, I would hope that uh, the administration uh, might review this in particular. Obviously, we hope the administration would review many aspects of its policy in, in the areas that come before the committee and the subcommittee. But I, I, I would hope that the administration might review this because I just think it's, it's devastating. Um, our other distinguished guest, Steve, how, how will it affect you? Well, it it says the others have outlined, it just limits your choices. So when the tax rate goes to 55% and you've got $22 million that comes out of your profits, that's $22 million and we're privately held, nobody takes any dividends out, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it, it's reinvestment in new plants, reinvestment in job opportunities, and reinvestment in research development. That's the only places you've got to, got to go to, to make those cuts. I, I have yet had it explained to me as to how this even came about and as to how it could possibly be on, on, on revenue itself. So, Congressman, uh, I mean, one of the fallacies in which this tax is built, and until we can communicate this, we're not going to get rid of it, is this concept of health care reform added 30 million insured lives to the rolls. Therefore, there is going to be that much more money flowing into the system, and all of our businesses will benefit because of the $30 million. And that was the justification for putting this tax on the device industry. Unfortunately, those that did that don't understand how we get paid for our products. We get paid by hospitals, in my case, ambulance companies that use my defibrillators. Um, and our products are used on people whether or not they are insured, yeah. right? We are not going to see an uptick because there are less insured patients. I, I think that's an excellent point that, that, that the defibrillator serves those who need it regardless of whether or not they are insured. I, I don't have right. a credit card slot built yeah. into the defibrillator yet to slide before yeah. we save a life. And uh, no ambulance is going to buy a second defibrillator because now they're transporting yeah. insured patients. Yes, You're thanks. exactly right. Thank you. Alex? And I would... Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. I was just going to say, as far as the device tax is concerned, we're, we're very clear on, on the impact. In the first year, we know that it would cost our company uh, $15 million. We know that that would uh, be a hard hit for us with regard to R&D. Um, R&D. Yeah. Absolutely, without question. It would slow yes. down innovation for us, which, as I mentioned before, is the absolute lifeblood of our company, as it is for all of our companies. Um, and if, if I could add one point, which um, has to do really with, I think, what, what you talked about, Rick, 
It, there's some unintended consequences that have come about as a result of Obamacare that I can speak to directly in my industry. Um, and what I mean by that is that there's, um, there's been a lot of pushback by insurance companies, by payers, by private payers to pay for spine surgery. At the same time, they've had record profits over the last several, several months in particular, or quarters in particular. And what we believe has been happening is that they've essentially concocted guidelines um, using actuarial firms such that they don't have to pay for spine surgery. There's not a reimbursement issue per se, it's not a regulatory issue, but it's slowed down the entire market by as much as 15% of procedures that have just gone away. And so what they're trying to do on that front, and we, we hear this from surgeons and patients consistently, so people that are in dire need of spine surgery are being rejected by the insurance companies who are fearing for their bottom line and doing everything they can to limit the amount of care that's being performed in the spine. So it's counterproductive, space. counterproductive. Completely counterproductive, and as I say, about 15% of the market has disappeared overnight, and it continues to be a very big battle. Well, thank you, and I, I yield back, uh, Madam Chair. Well, thank you everyone for being here. This, is, this has been, a, I think, a very helpful discussion to the committee. The medical, medical device industry is one which we can be proud of as Americans, and we want to continue to make sure that we are the leader, that you all can be successful, and that we continue to be the land of innovation and that we can compete in that global environment. Uh, so I look forward to working with you as we continue to address these very important thank issues. You thank, you thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, each of them have brought some examples. They have tables set up if you have the time to stop by. That would be great. <laughs>